human brain goes through a very long phase of anatomical development, which starts before birth and finishes many years later. We call that neurodevelopment. Anything that is interacting with the um, construction of this brain will lead to a problem in neurodevelopment. Well, we all know that there are problems in neurodevelopment that are very serious, but actually the majority of these are not so serious, so they are not so obvious. They are serious, but they are not obvious. They affect cognition. Cognition is the process of knowing. It is what it distinguishes us from animals and what gives us capabilities to behave and to thrive in a complex human society. Children with neurodevelopmental problems have alterations in their learning, in their social adaptation, and that creates a lot of stress in these children, in their families. It costs a lot of money to society as well. Approximately at least one in 10 children in modern societies has this problem. And we think that at least two thirds of these children had this problem starting in fetal life. I am a fetal medicine specialist and I am supposed to be an expert in treating and diagnosing fetal diseases. However, uh, for many years, I thought, like many as me, that there were only problems in the brain when something very serious was happening inside, like a very severe asphyxia, a very severe infection. But actually, we were wrong, because that's not the case. In reality, we know today that this brain here is extremely sensitive to many conditions that for long we thought would be not so important. We know now that these conditions are changing the configuration of this brain and that will make that this brain works differently after birth, which means all the rest of our life. And that's, in a way, quite logical. We should have been aware of that because uh, the brain is really changing a lot. That's a brain at 20 weeks of gestation, about half way through the nine months. And that's a brain at the end of gestation. There have been millions of neurons who have been created every day here. Not only they are created, they just migrate from the center of the, of the brain to the periphery, to the cortex, and they grow so much, they, they fold the cortex and they create this typical appearance of the brain. Not only they grow, but they organize, they get connected, they create networks. Of course, they are not functioning yet because the baby is not actually thinking, or at least as far as we know, but they are creating the basic networks that will serve as a platform for a normal function. But everything has to be perfect because this follows a very carefully designed program and everything has to work in a perfect environment. What happens when the environment is not perfect? There are many examples about that, but I will talk you, I will mention just one. Fetal growth restriction is a problem that happens when the, when the placenta is not giving the fetus all the nutrients, all the oxygen that this fetus needs. And that is creating a real problem in the program of the construction of the brain because how can, how can the genes manage that? They have to adapt. Well, some of you will be aware of epigenetic changes. Genes really can adapt to things. And these epigenetic changes will take place and the brain will eventually be constructed, but in a different manner. So, and these changes, even if the conditions change after birth, will remain. We have had fetal programming. And that's what fetal programming is. Fetal programming affects many organs. It's not only affecting the brain, but uh, since we are talking about neurodevelopment, we will focus in what is the impact in the brain. And actually, in reality, we don't know exactly how this is working, but we know the final result of this process. And the final result is really that this brain will work differently and will sacrifice superior functions for the sake of conserving survival. And that's a logical thing that these problems remain because that's a law of nature, isn't it? The younger we are, the more the influence and the environment has on us. And that applies at the maximum expression in fetal life. Weeks in the life of a fetus are like years or decades in the life of an adult. So 
the problems that happen during our field of life change the configuration of our programming for the rest of our life. And the, they will remain in this position as we left it unless we use and take advantage of the ability to revert these changes. This ability is, in theory, proportional to the magnitude of the occurrence of the changes. And therefore, we should be able to use this ability. However, there are many problems. And if we talk about the brain, these problems are clear. There is indeed brain organization lasting after birth has taken place. The brain will continue organizing, and therefore, we could use this window of opportunity to act and try to change the evolution of things. However, the problem is that we are not aware that this brain is different. The brain is a computer that starts working little by little. And only when we ask this computer to work in complex functions, we will realize that the construction was not as we thought it was. And therefore, we have to wait until five, six, seven years to see these problems becoming evident. So we have a problem here, but also an opportunity, of course, and that's what medicine does, trying to convert problems in opportunities. It's a clear opportunity for public health. If we could identify the fetuses that are at risk, we could know who of them are sick, and then we could intervene trying to revert these problems. Sometimes we could do very little because the damage could be very important, but I can tell you the majority, we could revert a lot of the problems. So, of course, that is a huge challenge, but that's the modern medicine we will do in future years. I don't know who of you are aware, but that's the medicine of the future. For B medicine, it's a very famous uh, name. We need to predict. We need to prevent. We need to do that in a personalized way. And that's the way we will work in future years and in future decades. So the advance of these three goals that I just mentioned in the left is different. And we have advanced a lot. We know very well how can we identify groups of viruses that are at risk. And we know how to intervene on them. But the main problem is in the middle. We don't have good biomarkers. And that's a challenge. What is a biomarker? Well, a biomarker is anything that you measure in human body that tells you whether you are sick, whether you have a severe disease, whether the disease is milder, whether the treatment you are taking is going good or bad. Everything is a biomarker. Everything you can measure, blood pressure is a biomarker, actually. But in the brain, that is fairly more difficult. We cannot measure brain pressure. And the problem is that we are not looking for damage. Most of imaging techniques were developed to see differences in the structure. But there is nothing missing in these brains. These brains look the same when we look with the eyes of today's medical imaging. We need to see whether they are different inside, whether the wiring is different, whether there are things that we could, but how could we do that? That's a typical, again, example of modern research. We need to make questions that are very difficult. How can we see differences years before that they become real diseases. And that's the challenge of, of research. And it's not an easy thing. I will explain you a little what we've done here and how can you solve that. And if you want really to solve these very complex problems, you have to bring together everything. All knowledge has to be put together so you don't work only with doctors, but you work with biologists, engineers. You put them together in the same place, working for the same goals. And that's the only way of solving things. This is a process that has some mortality because they tend to kill each other during the first year. But those who survive are managing to produce good solutions afterwards. But it's critical that they work in a coherent manner and for the same goals. And on the other hand, you need to bring these people because if you really want to solve a problem in medicine, you really need to be expert, but not so much. Because expertise, in reality, is clouding our minds with preconceived concepts that we take as universal truths. They are very good for being a doctor and making decisions, because for making decisions in life, you need clear concepts. But these concepts are never solving the new challenges. So you really need to listen to new people to see their ideas. In the beginning, you will think that they are stupid ideas. Well, actually, most of them are. But in the end, some of them are not. And some of them have, have helped us to solve our problems. And I will show you a couple of examples of that. This is an example of preconceived ideas. If you ask 
experts to look at these two fetal ultrasound pictures, they will tell you they are normal. And the truth is that they look normal. I could not see any difference, actually. And if I would have to say which is the sick one, I would say it's the left one. But actually, it's the other way around. The left one corresponds to a fetus that eventually became a completely normal child. The other one was a fetus with an infection that now has a severe handicap. So, of course, there was a problem in this brain, but the ultrasound was normal. The problem is that doctors tend to say, the brain is normal. The brain looks normal, but the brain is not normal. It's with my eyes, I cannot see anything. So that has been one of the lines of research we have been working with for the last 10 years. Can we see differences? Can we quantify, not only ourselves, of course, other groups in the world, but we have been trying to say, OK, can we really quantify differences? Because it is not possible that we are doubling the resolution of ultrasound images every three, four years, and that we keep on seeing the same things. This means that our eyes cannot double the resolution, but there must be information here. So we have worked for years with mathematicians, engineers, and finally, one very intelligent engineer found an algorithm that worked very well and which actually extracts the descriptors of these um, ultrasound images in an extremely complex way that I would, of course, not be able to explain. And by means of machine learning, you can extract a formula that works like a very complex logistic regression, which finally classifies those subjects who are sick or who are healthy. And we have proven that this works very well. And actually, you can look at an ultrasound in utero, and you can predict whether the neurodevelopmental tests will be abnormal afterwards. So that's an example of how are we going to advance in these lines. This is a solution that is now being explored in many other fields in medicine, because it works so well that it was protected, it was transferred to, to industry, and it's now being developed. So it's an example of how bringing engineers, mathematicians working together, we create solutions, and these solutions are transferred to the productive sector. So they don't only improve health, but they create wealth in the same society in which they were created, which is the aim, I think, of modern research as well. I will show you another example, and that's uh, an idea that is being exploited in many fields in neurology. Why don't we look at the tracts of the brain, the white matter tracts, the connections between neurons, and that's, a connect, that's what they call the connectome. Well, we, you can be very ambitious and try to look the, to the connections between neurons, but of course you cannot do that with medical imaging. But you can really look at the connections between areas of the brain. You can reconstruct all these tracts, then you produce a segmentation of this brain. You have an atlas, three-dimensional, in which you segmentate the brain in 80, 100 uh, regions, and then you see how these regions are connected. And with that, you get a very complex network of relations. So again, you need experts in graph theory analysis and complex network analysis, but you can do that. And then afterwards, you can come up with a biomarker. And you can say, okay, I'm going to classify, I'm going to train my system, I'm going to see how this predicts who of these children are going to be normal or not. And we've just recently shown that indeed, by doing this approach, you can at birth predict which babies will be abnormal two years later. That's very promising, isn't it? It's, of course, results of research. But I have talked a little bit about human brain development, about philosophy of science, and I have given you a couple of examples. But I wanted to show you the problem of fetal brain programming, fetal brain development, and how technology can really improve these problems. Our vision is that in a few years, we will have markers for these problems, and that now they are very expensive, very slow, very unreliable. This happens all the time, but you, most of you who are young people know very well that this is going to change. It's changing exponentially, so in a few years, they will be cheap, quick, and applicable, and that will be the way in which we work for diagnosing these problems. Investing, investigating, diagnosing, treating fetal programming is investing in human life, in human development, from the very beginning of life, which is the most cost-efficient strategy that a public health system can do. So we think that in future years, we will have these solutions available. The challenges are important intellectually and technologically, but the rewards are huge from a scientific, from innovation point of view as well, and of course for improving health, which is the most important thing we have in life, don't we? Thank you. <laughs>